Good morning, everybody. So, um, because it's Mother's Day, um, I thought that we could have a chat about some, some parenting. I have, I'll, I'll lay out my meager credentials. I have three children, the eldest turned nine yesterday, and the youngest is four and a half. Um, in my opinion, that probably puts me in the sort of still on the newcomer end of things, um, because my eldest is what halfway to being an adult now, or just over. And uh, so there's a little bit, there's a little part of me that feels like, I don't know, do I have a voice in the place of parenting? But I, I look, I think I think I do. Um, and I have been doing children's ministry at this church, at New Life Church, and youth ministry for. Um, a, uh, 20 years. Um, I graduated in 2004 from high school and then I began serving in uh, the children's ministry from that point onwards, basically. Um, roughly, roughly 20 odd years. And I've seen kids like some of these young adults who aren't kids so much anymore, but I still call them kids. Um, grow up from babies, some of them, from little children, other ones, and uh, yeah. But even though I'm a newcomer, I, I feel like there's a universal truth that I've learned, and that is, parenting is hard. <laughs> and the laugh tells me that there is much agreement within the room. Parenting is challenging. I, uh, the, oh, Yep. Some days are like that, aren't they? Mother's Day, I don't know what yours was like. Ours involved various amounts of tears. Um, my four and a half year old still doesn't quite fully grasp the gift giving principle. <laughs> he made things at kindy and then was convinced that they were for him. And so, yes, that. It's hard, right? And, and there's, there's, an, there's sort of a feeling, and I, I, I wonder if this is every generation feels like this, but parenting is harder now than it's ever been. And I think every generation does that, because once you get out of it, you go, hey, it was not so bad, maybe. And all that blood, sweat, and tears, mums, one day of the year makes it all worth it, doesn't it? One day of burnt toast and, and maybe a sleep in. I genuinely, I genuinely was like, I'd, I had stuff to go. I, 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 my wife likes like a scrambled eggs and chorizo on some crusty toast with maybe some spinach and feta. And it's, it's quite nice. I like it. And I was like, we're going to do that. We're going to make that this morning. And... Um, one of my kids strolled into my bedroom, apparently, at five o'clock. I didn't know. I was asleep. So uh, my chance to provide that breakfast in bed and, and use my children to... It, it was gone. Um, yeah. So... Parenting is hard. And the battle is often the sense that I am failing again and again. And I'm hoping today that I can encourage you. I am a pastor's kid. And now my children are pastor's kids as well. And I'm incredibly grateful for the godly legacy of my parents and my grandparents. I have been blessed with three generations so far. And I think there's, as you go back, it's sort of, how you count the generations gets a little bit diluted because it gets wider and the tree branch gets wider and wider. But I, I think in some spots it's four generations, possibly five of Christian heritage. Um, not across the board, like I said, just you know, if you follow the right branch, you'll get there. Um, but my paternal, I think I'm saying that right, my dad's parents, paternal grandparents, they passed away nearly two years ago and lots of you will be aware of that. And uh, about six months before my nana, my paternal grandmother, had her stroke, 
my wife and I had the opportunity to go and, and sit with her and record a conversation. She had all these old photos out on the table and we just started to pick them up and say, what's this one? What's this one? What's this? And she's like, ah, oh, well, that, that was my first boyfriend in that leather bikey jacket on the motorbike. And it's like, oh, okay. My, my nana was an was a award-winning dancer. Um, she had her own dance company at one point until she became a Christian, at which point, at that stage in history, um, dancing and Christians was, was, didn't go together. And so she gave that up. She gave that up. But hearing these conversations was great. Like, I found out my grandpa, he had to propose three times. <laughs> he had to propose three times because my nana was committed to having a Christian husband and she wasn't convinced he was in. <laughs> and so he said, you know, will you marry me? And she went, no, you're not a Christian. We said, well, I am, I'm going to church. Not a Christian. And it wasn't until, it, it's, it's funny, it wasn't until he got baptized. There's this, there's this timeline of like, once he got baptized, it was very short time <laughs> to, to wedding. But uh, she held to that. And she had a commitment to pray for her grandchildren every day. And she did. And we'd call her on the... F- I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> It's hard to know if this is sadness or just really grateful. She would pray. She was committed to pray for her grandchildren by name. And she'd call up and she'd ask, how can I pray for you? And Dan would say, well, I've got this assignment. I've got this exam. I'm trying to do this. And I would, I would give her my things. And she would pray. She was committed she was committed to pray, her and grandpa, and they would sit down at breakfast. And my other grandparents were the same. We, uh, this is my maternal grandparents who are still alive. They were missionaries in Southeast Asia. And uh, if you want to go back, uh, you can go through our, our live stream. I feel like a professor. What am I doing? <laughs> um, you can go back through our live streams. Go back to November 2022. And there is, a, there is a talk there from when my grandpa came up and he shared about life growing up. And he talked about hope, hope that overcomes um, trials and adversity. That's not the exact title of the thing, but it was about hope. Because they had, he talked about when they came back from their honeymoon and they went back to their tin shed in Bula Kesep or something, wherever it was that they were, and... They woke up in the middle of the night to find torrential rain pour and the water flooding through and going under the bed for their, you know, it was this deep, the water, just the rain, whoosh. They just had to lie in bed and hope it passed eventually. When they woke up in the morning, it had gone. They had rats running through the roof. They could see them going across the rafters because it was just corrugated iron roofs. He led worship from a piano accordion. Can you imagine the power and the presence of God on that? And there's also great tragedies. He lost his mother to, to mental health challenges. And uh, um, a son, an uncle that I didn't ever actually have, um, died from a malaria medication overdose. And working through that, that they... <laughs> it must be gratitude. Because um, they're still alive. Um, they laboured. And it cost them. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. And the heritage and the legacy that I have. Because of what they did. Um, and they prayed for us every day as well. I have memories of doing sleepovers at their place. And they had a, at that stage when they were still mobile and more active, they had a two-story house that you could, it was across the road from the beach down in Singleton. And you could sit on their balcony and you could see the water and you can hear the waves and you can smell the salt. And it was great. And every morning before the sleepovers, we'd have breakfast up on the balcony. And they'd bring it up on trays, plonk it down. And on the tray would be um, the Every Day with Jesus, uh, My Daily Bread book. And we'd sit there and we'd have our toast and we'd have our Milo's. That was a treat. A Milo at breakfast. And... Uh, 
And then, before we could go anywhere, Grandpa pulls it out. Here it is, every day with Jesus, my daily bread, let's go. Okay, we're going to pray, we're going to pray for and talk and pray. This was, this was a normal part of my life, and I'm not, I, my point is I'm incredibly grateful. And then my parents, my dad has been in ministry my entire life. And mum has been a co-laborer with her that entire time too. And with all of that godly legacy that I've just shown you, it is quite natural for you to come to the conclusion that I was in fact a perfect child. (laughs) And that I came from a perfect family and my children are in fact even more perfect than I was because they're the next generation down. Of course, I'm not being truthful. I was once excluded from the New Life Kids program that we've just released our children to (laughs) by Mrs. Alison Pelling, who's not here this morning, but who still serves in that ministry. This is one of my claims to fame. One of the kids got kicked out. No, you can't come back. Your behavior is unacceptable. Okay. I remember having arguments, large arguments, because we had to be out of the house by 8.20 on a Sunday morning as a family to get to church because we've got to help set up, we've got to be there on time and, and do all the stuff. And we would just, I, I don't know why, but we would, we would fight. I don't, I don't want to go, or I'm not dressed, or I'm just dragging my feet, or I haven't done breakfast yet. It's like, well, all of it. Get in the car. All right, game face on. No. <laughs> but my point is, though, parenting is hard. It's a challenge for every generation. And it's getting harder because some, one, of the, one of the reasons it's getting harder is the prevalence of mental health issues impacting children. We've got young people overwhelmed with anxiety. They're struggling to battle depression. They're victims of forms of bullying that were unimaginable 20 years ago. They now carry the entire world, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the perverse, in their pockets. I held up a phone for those on the podcast. Um, And these devices have become so, here's a big word, ubiquitous. I knew it existed. I had to Google what it was just to make sure I was using it right. (laughs) That sometimes the risks aren't properly considered. Our culture is content to hand them a smartphone, give them access to YouTube, and then say, be quiet during dinner. We give them access to this stuff. We say, have fun. Sometimes with no boundaries at all. We're giving them pornography in their pocket, allowing the social media algorithms to expose our children to gender confusion, sexual perversion, all kinds of ungodly influences. And it's all in this tiny little thing. Videos, podcasts, music it goes on and as I was thinking about this I was thinking actually you know within Spotify for example you can tick the box that says exclude explicit content in general that only excludes the content that contains explicit language not necessarily explicit themes And so, as a parent, you can't just switch off. You can't go, I've ticked the box, I'm good. The YouTube Kids app. You can't just assume that what they're going to receive through that is the kind of content that you want going into your children, just because YouTube has said, that's safe enough for children. Because Children's programming is full of characters and attitudes and behaviors that you don't necessarily want your children copying. But YouTube says that's fine for kids. So you can't, I'm saying you can't switch off. You have to be proactive. You've got to be engaged with the content that your children are consuming because there's so much out there, so much accessible, and the risks are high. Kids today are getting updates, real-time updates about war zones with graphic 
footage, images, sound grabs, things that were not possible. The news cycle is now 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whereas back when the newspaper was the primary source of news, you got that for the day, and then you got the next one for the day, and the content you would read was already out of date by the time you read it, but you didn't know any better, and that was good. And so because as Christ-centered parents, we want our children to know God, we want our children to love God, I want to talk about raising our children to love God. I'm not an expert, I'm not a perfect father, you can ask my children. But I believe I've got some wisdom to share, and I've also taken a few things from uh, a man called Craig Grishel and some things that he did. Um, I've been influenced by him in this talk. And I still believe there's wisdom in what I have to say. And young people, you guys down here, don't you switch off. You're going to have children one day, or if not, you're going to have uncles. Sorry, you're, you're going to be uncles and aunties. You've already got the uncles, you're fine. But you might be an uncle or an aunt. You might serve, many of you do serve, in children's ministry. And so you still have a role to play. There's things that you can hit here. And teenagers in the room, there are things that you can learn when I get to it. You'll see. All right? So let's have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema. I heard someone pronounce it Shema. I thought that doesn't sound right. I Googled it. Shema. The emphasis is on the Ma. Shema. Here it is. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Let's have that up so we can read it, please. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Next one, please. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If we're going to be people that parent on purpose, if we're going to raise children who love God, we don't want to simply be known as a Christian family. A Christian family, unfortunately, has sort of been co-opted to be generally morally centered. Does that make sense? Like society goes, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Christian, yes, I hold some of the Christian values. Or I'm a Christian, I go to church for Easter. I heard someone refer to this as Christers. Christmas and Easter Christians, Christers. A... Um, and so we want to be more than that. We want to be known as more than just a Christian family. We want to be known as a Christ-centered family. Christ-centered families. That one can go up. Or not. Not a cultural Christian, not a Sunday Christian, or a social Christian... Not someone who ignores the Bible Monday through Saturday and pulls it out on Sunday, blows the dust off. Not someone who doesn't allow the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit into their lives Monday through Saturday. They come on Sunday, all right, I'm here for the Holy Spirit and when I leave again, I'll leave him here and he'll be here when I get back. We don't want to be that. A Christ-centered family is different. We see that loving God with all our heart, soul and strength is an all-of-life thing and it is our highest calling. This is incredibly important because as parents, especially in the early years of raising our kids, no one has greater influence on your children than you do. It's not the children's ministry leader. It's not the youth ministry. It's you as parents. Those ministry leaders, they're useful, they're helpful, they're great I lead those teams, I know the teams that I have, they're wonderful people and they're doing great stuff, but they are operating in a support role, not as the primary faith formers in your children. And I'm not saying this as an accusation. Many of you, I don't know all of you and all of how you're parenting, but many of you are on this page. It's meant to be an encouragement of, yes, you're doing it right, okay? 
Parents are the primary factors in faith formation. And the biggest factor within that is how integrated Jesus is to your life. All right? How integrated he is to your life. It's exactly what God said to Israel in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're on the road. Talk about them when you're at home, when you go to bed and when you get up. Does the fragrance of Jesus permeate your life? Does it permeate your house? And I don't simply mean that you play worship music to create a nice, moody atmosphere. God, we don't want God to be simply a part of your life. We want Him to be our lives. And we want our children to see that. So what are some of the challenges that we're facing as parents at the moment? I might even be bold enough to suggest some areas where we need to get better. There's probably lots, let's be honest, probably heaps. But I'm going to pick three that are pretty general. Here they are. Number one, we risk too little. Number two, we rescue too quickly. And number three, we model too weakly. Let's do number one. We risk too little. Risk aversion and pain avoidance are some of the highest values in our society today. I am so afraid of emotional pain that there are words that you are not allowed to use in my presence. Right? This is, the, this is the society that we've got at, at the moment. Now, I didn't grow up in the good old days, some of you might have, where kids were kicked out of the house at 7 or 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning and told, don't come back till it gets dark. That was not my experience, but it might have been yours. That's pretty risky. <laughs> where are you going to get food? I don't know, sort it out. Where are you going to get a drink? Well, you'll find your neighbor's hose at some point, Right? <laughs> Sorry, can we just do this, just so I know I'm not alone on this one. Who drank from the hose? Yeah, all right, we're all safe, we're good. But no, that's too risky now. You're not allowed, you shouldn't be drinking from the hose, there's dangers in that. We turned out, <laughs> we turned out just fine. Now, it's not tasty, we all know it tastes gross. Ta hose water is, is not nice, but it does the job. Or perhaps, depending on your vintage, you may have a history of riding around in the back of utes. Fairly normal. <laughs> youth group. <laughs> I don't do that at youth group. <laughs> but as a kid, I've got memories of doing that. We grew up in Katanning for a little while, so we'd get on motorbikes, we'd sit on helmets, I'd sit on the front like, Ugh. I'm holding the little cross beam, the big teenage, the teenagers, not even adults, just teen, like, 14-year-old boy behind me going, down these creek beds, roof, straight up the other side. I'm four years old going, yeah. <laughs> Simon Parnell, he was around then. He was one of those teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> but we used to take risks like that. Now some of those risks are just too high. And look, hear me, we all know there's wisdom, right? Wearing a helmet is a good idea. It's not fashionable, but it's a good idea. Protecting our kids is wise, but they still need breathing space. They still need to be able to experiment, to develop independence. I remember during our time of living in the United States, we were living in a place called Pasadena, and the nearest supermarket was about 500 meters. I actually looked it up the other day. I was like, how? It felt like a long walk every time I did it, but it was only 500 meters. I mean, I was nine years old, so it probably was a long walk. Um, and very occasionally, my mum would say, okay, we need milk, here's some money, go. And Daniel and I would walk down the street, it was funny, you come out of the, you come out of the apartment complex, and if you turn left, you're all right. If you go right, you might die. <laughs> that was genuinely the street we lived on. If you headed that way, you may engage in some sort of gang, something or other. That was the reality of where we lived. And so mum would be like, here's the money, and make sure you go left. And so we walk down and we buy the, soup, the gallon of milk, which is like four liters. Again, a nine-year-old boy got like f this four-liter gallon of milk. It might have even been like two gallons, because I remember they used to come as a, with this little 
carry handle between them things. And you just have to lug it and hope for the best. Um, but we used to do things like that a few months ago. So this is just highlighting this whole risk avoidance thing. A few months ago, uh, we, just, we live about 300 metres from a supermarket and uh, we needed some toilet paper, I think. And we had guests over and my son, my, he's now nine, but he was eight then, he was desperate. He's like, send me, send me, I could do it. Yeah, your focus isn't great. <laughs> do you know which toilet paper we're trying to get? Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you sure? Because I really don't want that cheap stuff. In the end, we sent him off. I gave him my phone, and I FaceTimed him on my iPad, and away he went. That was, look, that was giving him some independence while avoiding some risk. <laughs> uh, it, look, it, it paid off. It was all right. He didn't die. We got the toilet paper in the end, and he felt great about it. We don't risk enough. In our efforts to protect our children from pain and risk, we're robbing them of confidence. In his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey uses a phrase that has stuck with me since I read it, and it's this, borrowing strength builds weakness. If you forever tie your child's shoelace, they will never learn. Right? Right? They'll have to wear Velcro shoes for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Borrowing strength or stepping in to avoid that risk builds a weakness in our children. If they never get the opportunity to develop their own strength because we rob them of that opportunity to risk something and experience pain, it breeds a dependence in them that is not on God. It creates a dependence in them that is on you or the people around them. We want to have children that are dependent, who understand their need for God. If they never have the opportunity to risk, how will they develop that? Because that's how you do it, right? It's not putting the Lord to the test. It's like stepping out in a step of faith and risking it. And then you grow in confidence in God's character because He meets you in that space. I want to suggest that Christ-centered people have learned to have a dependence and faith in God. Like Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. We want to be people who please God. Number two, we rescue too quickly. Most parents don't want their child to fail. Sometimes that's because we don't want it to reflect poorly on us as parents. We've all been there, right? Your child has forgotten, <coughs> procrastinates on an assignment and they come to you the night before in a panic. I can't do it. I can't do it. Chat GPT. Right? You have a chance right there. Do you step in and fix, help, resolve it and win the science fair? And live vicariously through your child? Or your son, as is the case in my family, your son forgets his jacket on a cold day, despite being warned multiple times, it's a cold day, cold weather, make sure your jacket's in your bag. Make sure your jacket's in your bag. Phone rings, it's the school. Your son is cold, he's left his jacket behind. you stop maybe my work my workplace I've got some flexi hours I can afford to actually go home in that circumstance and go and retrieve the jacket or do you just let it ride say we warned you we gave you the opportunity you didn't do what you needed to do I don't want to sound harsh here but Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man or a person reaps what they sow. Consequences make for a great teacher. 
rescuing too quickly leads to situations where young adults do not have the confidence in themselves. They haven't developed the skills necessary that when it comes to a job interview, some of them are bringing their parents into the room. This is a thing. My dad drove me to a job interview once. He waited in the car. I had to go in. Very nervous, anxious, step in. Nathan, yeah, that's me on the list, thank you. Badge, group interview, and I leave. How'd that go? I don't know, find out later. I never got a call. (laughs) When we are robbed of experiencing God's natural consequences, is it any wonder that there's a lack of the fear of the Lord? Because natural consequences are things that God has established. In Luke 15, the prodigal son, he left home, he made some terrible choices, he wallowed in the consequences of those choices, he remembered his loving father, and then he went home. His father welcomed him with open arms, even running to him as he was coming down the road, but the father never rescued. He redeemed, he restored, but he never rescued. Number three, we model too weakly. When it comes to parenting, the adage is more is caught than taught. It's a monkey see, monkey do thing, right? If we don't treat our personal faith seriously, how can we expect our children to? Your children don't just become what you say, they become what they see. For example, a few weeks ago, my son came home from church, and while we were getting lunch ready, he disappeared into his room. As lunch was ready, he comes running back out, big smile on his face, he's beaming, he goes, Dad, I've just been reading my Bible. Oh, great. Yeah, I was highlighting things. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what, but I did it. <laughs> he's copying what he's seen modeled. He's seen his mother's Bible that is marked up and falling apart He's seen people in this community, because this is on a Sunday, he's seen people in this community doing the same thing, highlighting, underlining, and he's developing this idea that this is normal and this is good. Let me pose this question for you. If I asked your kids if they've ever seen you have time with God, or perhaps pray as a couple, what would they say? There's not an accusation of whether you do it. I'm asking them, have they seen it? Do they see it regularly? Does it happen? I know what my answer is. I'm not necessarily happy about that answer. Remember, I'm, I'm preaching to myself in all of this as I've been working through this. It's not me versus you. This is all of us in this, all right? We value the private and the hidden times with God. Maybe you're one of those people that wakes up at 5.30 in the morning, every morning, to make sure you can get your time in with God before you go to work and before the chaos of children descends. Now, if you've got teenagers, that 5.30 might be more like 6.30, 6.45, 7 o'clock. Um, it just depends. Or do you stay up late once they're in bed and do it then? We value those times, and they're good, and they're important. But I want to suggest, or we'll ask a question Is there potentially a higher value for discipleship in them seeing it? What if when your child stumbles out of bed and falls down the stairs in the morning, or as in the case of my household, leaps out of bed like they're in a 90s aerobics class... (laughs) What if they came into the living room or the kitchen, the breakfast bar, whatever, and found you there, Bible, journal, worship music playing, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you prefer the quiet. They'll come and they'll interrupt, but you can coach them. What if you had their Bible next to you? We have one child, consistently, like 5.15, What if your quiet time involved them as well? And they come along beside you and join in. 
It would be a disruption. It would not be perhaps as comfortable for you as you'd like. Yeah, there you go. This is not me being a perfect parent. It was one photo at one time. Don't get... <laughs> but he is, in fact, reading a Bible. Reading is a generous word. Um, he's looking at a book that has pictures and words in it. Because I was sitting there reading mine. And he pulled up a chair next to me, plonked himself down, had his... And he, read, and he just looked at the pictures. But it's modelling. That's discipleship. Again, I'm not praising myself, one photo, one time. Don't get too excited. But the point is, that's what it looks like. And it'll cost you something. It'll cost you a little bit of your time with God. You know what? I don't think God minds. If you're the type of person who wakes up at 5.30 to do a 5.30 to 6 o'clock, some of you are going, half an hour, I can get 10 minutes. Whatever, whatever the time frame is that you use, what if you built into it that there was going to be five or ten minutes at the end where your child comes down and disrupts you and you say, hey, why don't you sit here and read? Who well, I want breakfast, you slide the apple over. You snack on that, we'll do breakfast in a minute. Read your Bible. Read your Bible with me. What can we pray? You take that moment to be intentional in your discipleship. We don't want to be, a Christ-centered family is one that models strongly and disciples intentionally. We don't model too weakly. But those are the challenges. We risk too little, we rescue too quickly, we model too weakly. So let me leave you with two, two ideas, ways to counter some of these things. All right? There's something called the law of exposure, and it basically means this, who and what you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. This exposure can be active and intentional, or it can simply be permissive, what you just let occur. If our children are constantly exposed to bad attitudes, negativity, over-sexualization, etc., etc., then we cannot be surprised when they walk away from God, because that is not what is being built into them. Having said that, there are situations that are out of our control. When your child goes to school, you have less control over what they say, how they behave, the games they play, the people they hang around with. What then? We need to empower our children to make good choices, to learn to filter these things through the Bible. We've all been teenagers, so we all know the language that flies around in high schools. Right? Surely. I'm not... Yes? We, we know what goes on. <laughs> Here, if you've got a school where the primary school and the high school have some overlap and, and interaction, like even just casually being in the same spaces together, your child, young child, may come home with language that you wonder where they heard that from. Or if you take your child, as we did, to a skate park, a local skate park, because he really wanted to ride his scooter, I said, okay, go for it. You come home, what does this mean? Whoa! In that moment, how do you disciple your child? They have to learn to filter these things through the Bible, and that comes by you demonstrating that. To be able to say, hey, you know what, Ephesians 4.29 says, don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up, for encouragement. That's a Mrs. Pelling Bible verse from when I was very, very little. <laughs> it's still in there. And so then you go, hey, is that unwholesome talk, do you think? Is that, does that kind of language build others up? If you're, if you're saying that so-and-so is stupid and a loser, and blah, blah, blah. is that building them up or tearing them down? So is that the kind of language that we want to have? No. Okay. Cool. Let's not do that then. I believe that all of us in our room, in this room, want to see our children grow to love God. And we can't force our kids to love God, but we can expose them to people and experiences that increase the likelihood of spiritual growth. What does it look like? I've already touched on a bit, but here's two ideas. Number one, expose them to the joy of knowing God personally. 
They need to see in you the joy that comes from your relationship with God. The comfort he brings in the grief. The peace he brings in pressure. The strength in the stress. The joy. Hey, buddy. That's my nephew. The joy that knowing him brings. They need to hear about the joy of revelation. Hey, guys, I was reading the Bible today, and I felt like this is a verse that I'd never seen before. I know I've read it, but it's like God opened my eyes, and it gave it new meaning. But, Dad, you've already read it before. I know, but it's like God went, bing, and turned a light on, and suddenly I saw more words or something. I don't know. It's like, cool, hey? They need us to try and explain the emotional response that we have in worship when God or any time when God comes to us. This is sort of like a, you know, if you're someone who's crying, if you're, if you're, if you're a, someone who loves to worship and like when God draws near to you, you you're one of those criers. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes your kids are like, oh, they're sad. It's like, no, it's not sad. Well, what is it? The tears. Try and explain it. Don't be like, oh, it's just God. Be like, well, it just felt like God came and said, hi. And I went, oh, oh, oh." (laughs) that's a bit weird, Dad. I know, but like, that, that just is what it is. When God draws near, he's so much bigger and I'm so small that sometimes the only thing I can do is just be like overwhelmed. Be like, this is amazing. Oh, They need us to try. They need us to try. They need to know that it's real and that God wants them to know Him the way that we know Him. And I'm using the word know here in that experiential sense. It's not information, it's relationship. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. So how do we do this? We need to normalize Christ-centered living. We need to normalize an environment where your kids don't feel like God's stuff is something they have to do, but rather it is a normal part of your family culture. And they want to be, they want to involve God in all aspects of their lives because that is what they've seen modeled. It is what's normal. Do you ever say things like, I am incredibly grateful that I have this fairly average job that God gave me so that I can supply for the needs of my family. That will shift a child's perspective on work. If they understand that what you're doing is so that you can have provision for your family and beyond that to be able to freely give and bless and show Christ and His love to everybody that's around you with every opportunity that you have. When your child does well on a test, do you say, great job? Or perhaps you'd like to say, I love the way that you chose to honor God by studying. And God has honored you with that result. Well done. We just shift the framing. That's all it is. And we bring God into every aspect of his life. Maybe you want to be someone who's like, God, thank you. A steak. <laughs> Rather than simply just saying grace, you might be eating and going, I am so grateful that God made cows. Sure, they fart a lot and there's implications for that, but the food is great. Perhaps your child loses a major sporting event and they're devastated. Do you say, they're there, it's okay, you did good? Or do you say things like, you tried your absolute best and you honored God by doing that. And you showed Christ-like graciousness in the way that you conducted yourself, even though you lost. We just want to frame them a little bit differently and bring Jesus, bring God into the conversation. When they ask for advice, do you open up the Bible? Do you pray? They're just questions. They're not not accusations. They're just questions. 
do you have conversations about God through your house normally? I'm fortunate that I can have pretty deep theological questions with my wife because we've both done theology degrees. And we've, we, we enjoy those conversations. Maybe you don't. I'm not saying you need to. <laughs> I'm not saying you need to have a soteriological conversation at home. That means a, salva- a, a, a conversation about salvation. That's what that word <laughs> means. You don't have to have those conversations at home. But I can and we do. We have chats like that. And my kids stare at us and go, but Jesus, God, different things pick up in the conversation. They can track with parts of it. It's normal for them in their family to talk about God. And one day you will find, if you create this environment, you will find that your children will come to you with the questions, the doubts that they have. And because you've created a Christ-centered environment in your house and and a family culture that involves God in everything, the conversation flows easier because they, they go, it's normal to talk about God. It's normal to say, I don't necessarily agree with that or I'm struggling to understand what this means or those types of things. That becomes normal so they can have that conversation with you. And you know what? One day, they'll surprise you. They'll turn around and say, so I was reading my Bible. You go, what? And I came across this part and I felt like God sort of opened my eyes and I said, maybe, maybe it means this, maybe it could mean this. Hey, look at that. Now, it's not a family faith anymore. It's becoming real for them. It's becoming their faith. Number two, expose them to the power and the presence of God in His church. You can expose them to what God is doing through His people. Psalm 92, 12, verse 12 and 13 says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. A Christ-centered family is planted in a local Christian community because they know the value of being in community. Let me ask you this. This is going to get prickly. In your family, what things are non-negotiable? What things are not optional? School, right? Dentist, maybe. Probably should be. A visit to the doctor, as required. Dance, basketball, soccer, extended family gatherings. There are lots of things in our lives that we deem not optional. Please let church be one of those. It is a not optional activity. My family has shared from the front about Daniel. Daniel was doing, was pursuing Um, some high-level basketball as a teenager and he kept getting invited to try out for things and going up and up and up and it got to the point where he was invited to um, be part of this special training on this this team and uh, but it was going to mean Sunday mornings Sunday morning involvement and as a family it was like sorry Dan no we don't interfere with Sunday mornings this is the non-optional And at the time, pretty sure Dan was pretty cross about that, pretty devastated. Now as an adult with his own children, he's like, that was the right call. Sometimes making the right call is going to hurt a little bit, but they'll get over it. And they'll they'll understand the value. What is not optional? Growing up, we didn't need to go, are we going to church this week? We knew. I mean, this church was started in 1997 by my parents and a handful of people, and I've been here ever since. Um, so there was never a question of whether I was going to church. <laughs> if we didn't turn up, you know, 30% of the congregation didn't turn up back in the, in the early days. Um, even when we were in America and we were looking for churches to join, we would do home church. My mom had a piano and a speaker and we would have worship times and we'd have Bible conversations and we'd pray. Now I'm telling you now, I did not like those. But I understand the value. I understand what was being communicated. And boy, they were hard. Some of them were incredibly hard because of some of the things that I was working through as a nine-year-old. I remember hiding under pillows on the couch, just tucked up, balled up. And my parents spending two or three hours trying to coax me out. Because I was so adamant I didn't want to do it felt weird, I didn't like it, among other things. 
but they were committed to it. When we go away on holidays, we'd find a church in Bustleton or Pemberton or wherever we could, wherever we were, we'd find a church and we'd go. It was normal for us. If we prioritise something over church and never prioritise church over something else, what is the value that you are communicating about church? When you let it slide, now I'm, I'm not saying all the time, but you know what I mean. If it's constant, if it's happening regularly, what are you communicating? And it's not simply about attending either. You want to find ways to get your kids involved. We want them to own their life in this community. It's not mum and dad's church, it's my church. Do you know what? Some of the questions I ask kids, some, when I, I work with children, right? They go, hey, do you go to church? They go, yeah, which one? I don't know. So confused. What do you mean you don't know? Oh, well, like, yeah, we meet in this building. Most of them do. Um, we have a guy that preaches. Most of them do. Yeah, I don't know. They don't know because they're not actually buying into the community because they're not getting involved. We have serving teams. We put chairs out. We have things you can set up out there. You can, there are ways you can get involved. And if you as a parent are involved and your children are not, I want to challenge you, find a way to bring them along. Again, it'll cost you. You'll be far more efficient putting all the chairs out all by yourself. You bring a six-year-old into that, you might as well find another adult because you're going to need it, right? But the value that you are communicating, this is our community. We are doing this. For years before we moved into this place, we were bump in, bump out. We had two whopping trailers full of heavy stuff. And Dan and I, from the age of 13 and 11-ish, we were on sound teams. This was after. Al used to lug things up two flights of stairs. That was hardcore back in those days. <laughs> up the fire escape, two flights of stairs up the fire escape, dragging, whopping big speakers like these. Um, but we, for, for years, for years and years, Dan and I were on these roadie teams. Every three weeks, we'd turn up early. Our parents would get us there early. Then we'd pull all the stuff out and we'd learn... We were invested in the community. James used to come early. There's a photo here. Have we got this? There we go. Not so much anymore, but back when his cuteness was overflowing. <laughs> James used to come up on stage and he's got a broken ukulele because he used to whack it on the walls at home. And a broken piano pedal, that's what his foot's on down there, because I have pedals in front of me. I had things for the guitar and stuff. So he would stand there, and he would rock away, and bling, 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 bling. And it's like, yeah, you just, cool, you're, great job, James. Okay, now it's time to service, start, go, go with mum. But he would come early, and he would just stand there, and he'd be part of it. So remember, this is, exposing them to the presence and power of God in his church, in his community. That's the goal here. Get them involved as much as you can. All right, I want the worship team, you guys can come up. Now, there's a chance, and I'm hoping this isn't necessarily a lot of you, but you might be feeling slightly deflated. You might be looking at those lists of things about we risk too little, we rescue too quickly, and um, we model too weekly, and you might be identifying with some of those, going, I haven't done a great job. I don't want you to feel deflated. Or you might be feeling like, hey, those things of exposing them to the joy of knowing God personally and exposing them to His power and presence in His community, you might be going, I don't think I do that very well. You know what? Start today. That's it. Start today. Make a choice to develop a Christ-centered family culture. Don't go from zero to a hundred, okay? Don't set an unrealistic target. Don't be like, we're going to have family worship times every day. We're going to do devotions after every meal. I'm going to come to you and sit with you at school so I can do a devotion with you after lunch. Like, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Maybe where you're at, maybe where your family's at, we're just going to say grace. We're going to say grace. We're going to make sure we intentionally 
thank God at the start of meals when we're together. Maybe you want to go to Kurong, maybe you've got one, you want to go and buy a devotional book, just a five-minute thing, like with my grandparents, every day with Jesus, my daily bread. And after, the, after your dinner meal, you go, hey, before you all disappear, we're just going to take five minutes. Oh, Dad, it's just five minutes. My children do that. Oh, no, you know what? Just sit. We persevered. After a couple of weeks, the complaining gets less. <laughs> start, start where you are at. Maybe develop the practice of asking your kids about one thing they can be thankful for and one thing they'd like to ask God for help with on the drive to school. Be proactive. Only you know what it's going to look like for your family, you and the Holy Spirit. So maybe you want to do that. And for you young people, you can get around these kids. You can speak to them. That power and the presence of God, those two things, your personal faith, your personal relationship with Jesus, and being amongst the people of God, you can contribute in that way too. You can normalize it. You, 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 Sam. You can normalize these things in your interactions with them. And some of you are like, I don't want to talk to six-year-olds. That's okay. But if they see you involved in things, it all counts. We cannot force our children to love God. And for some people, that's an incredibly painful reality. There are, some, there are friends of mine who walk that out. They cannot force their children to love God and they have five or six and none of them do. And it breaks their hearts. But what we can do is we can expose them to the people and experiences that increase the likelihood of spiritual growth. Let's be a community of Christ-centered families where we involve Him in everything. See if there are ways you can change that language. Hey, you honored God in the way that you approached that project. I love the way that you showed Christ-likeness by shaking hands with that opposition team, even though they beat the snot out of you. Let's be a community of Christ-centered families. I invite you to stand and I pray. God, in your wisdom, you've created family units. And they're challenging and messy and joyful and fun. There's hard parts and there's easy parts. And as parents, the pain of not being able to force our children to love you is, can be hard. But we want to be a community, God, of Christ-centered families who involve you in all of life. You're not a side, you're not a side dish, you're not something we add on, you're not a Sunday reality, but throughout the week, in every moment, exposing our children to the joy of knowing you and the joy of the power and the presence of God amongst his people. So help us. God, help us to do this. It's not easy and it will cost us. Discipleship costs. It's uncomfortable at times. It's inconvenient a lot of the time. But we know it's worth it for those moments. We know it's worth it. 
So help us, God. Strengthen us. Strengthen this community today to be Christ-centered families. Amen. Sing to close this morning.